dead and gone everybody hang me oh hang me i'll be dead and gone i wouldn't mind the hanging but the laying in the grave so long poor boy i've been all around this world station what is up everybody pop pop boom welcome to pcp movie night i am super excited to talk about the movie tonight because the only way the only way we can cover the cinematic milestone that is surf ninjas the only way we can top that the only way we can follow that up is with the coen brothers so tonight we're talking about one of my favorite coen brothers movies not my favorite but definitely maybe top five for sure for me. Tonight, we're talking about Inside Lewin Davis, starring Oscar Isaac, and as I said, written and directed by the Coen brothers. And when we say Coen brothers, a lot of people like to show up, including, where's your scrotum? What is up, my man? How you Dude, doing, man? Man, I am, I am pumped to talk about this film. Like, it's... It is so relatable as a creative type. So it's like, this is, this is, this is my soul, brother. I'm excited to talk about it. Yes. This movie is my soul too. Very excited. Speaking of my soul, it's Brooks. What is up? First time watching this movie, man. Yep. Never heard of it. Never heard of it. Yep. How long have you known me? Have you known me since 2013? Have you known me for the last 10 years? Holy shit. It's the 10th anniversary of this film. Mm. I feel older than I've ever felt, man. It's the 10th anniversary of Lewin Davis. There's going to be a new Criterion Blu-ray coming soon. Speaking of 10th anniversary editions, it's the 10th anniversary of uh, Missing Link. What's up, Steph? How you doing? <laughs> what up, guys? <laughs> Glad to be here. Co you, you said Coen Brothers? I'll come running. Yeah, right? I I, I remember I, I put a thing in the chat a few days ago, and I was like, hey, I got some spots left for Lewin Davis, and Steph was first immediately. It was like, Coen Brothers? <laughs> Nuff said, brother. Nuff said. <laughs> Also, we can't talk about the Coen brothers without Mike the Voice Matthews, but he's running late because I think he likes to feel important, and that's okay. We'll allow him to feel important tonight because he is important. We're all important. Anyway, Absolutely. this movie, 2013, Inside Lewin Davis. The Coen brothers are a big deal to a lot of cinephiles, right? And even to casual fans of cinema, which we all are, obviously casual fans, <laughs> Um I mean, we just think burial grounds kind of a piece of shit, right? So we're we're not like the 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 most cinephile-y cinephiles out there. However, uh, scarf that was a dig at scarf pad. Um, so inside inside Lewin's body, he didn't even know what the fuck movie we're talking about tonight. Anyway, <laughs> this is not a well-known Coen Brothers film, and there's a lot of yeah. Coen Brothers films that are not well known amongst the casual fans, right? Like everybody knows Fargo, Big Lebowski, No Country for Old Men, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? But when we start talking about Barton Fink, we start talking about Blood Simple, we start talking about Miller's Crossing, we start talking about Inside Lewin Davis, A Serious Man, which is another Ooh. one. I think this was the one right after Serious Man, actually. 
I could be wrong on that. I think Serious Man was like 2010 or something. That's a great a true true grit. I I think was, but they were very close together. Yeah, very. Yeah, you're probably right. Maybe True Grit was in between those. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah, really good shit though. I love the Coen Brothers. We did an entire podcast about the Coen Brothers movies, their history, all that stuff. And we all share our top five. So check that out. It's available on iTunes. It's available on YouTube. Coen Brothers podcast. Check that out if you want more of my love shared about the Coen Brothers and their history and their their entire uh, filmography. I almost said discography. I was like, what the fuck are they? <laughs> Puff Daddy, you know, they're dropping shit. The Ballad of Buster Scruggs sounds like a Puff Daddy album. Anyway. I love this fucking film. I think it's goddamn amazing. This is one of my favorite Coen Brothers films. I would, I would dare to say top five. I will goddamn get on a branch, right? And say it's in my top three. I would say it's number three. Right behind mm. Oh Brother Where Art Thou and No Country is Inside Lewin Davis. And I know that that's high praise. And for some people, it's mid-tier or upper mid-tier Coen Brothers. But for me, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, cinematography done by somebody different, Bruno uh, Del Bonnell, who did some cool stuff. We'll talk about him a little bit later, but it's a different cinematographer than we're used to. And I think it really helps accentuate certain moments of this movie. I think it's a masterpiece. I think it's bleak, melancholy, and somber, right? Yet I think it's still very inspiring, hopeful, optimistic at times, even though it's not so much, right? But I think it's a poignant film. I really do. And I think yeah. it's beautifully filmed and performed. And I think it, have, it has a reverence for the subject matter, which dives so heavily into folk music. And it is a spiritual successor for me. For Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? As far as the use of music in the film and the, the, the reverence that the film has for the music that it's using. Even when it's using things in a, di like a sense of dichotomy where you're seeing the seriousness of what Lewin's doing and the ridiculousness of other people, right? Where like Peter right. Paul and Mary type shit, it's way different when you hear hang me, oh, hang me versus 500 miles, right? right? Like, and that's yeah. the thing. There's like 500 miles of style between those two things. They all get classified as folk music. This movie says a lot about folk music. This movie is anchored by great performances, brilliant cinematography, some of the best I can't think of better screenwriters outside of the Coen brothers. I could maybe put Tarantino there, you know, but like the Coen brothers, I think blow Tarantino out of the water as far as screenwriting goes. They are some of the best cinematic film writers in my lifetime. I adore this movie. I love it. What about you, Manny? Overall, this was your second time watching. You said, what do you think about inside Lewin Davis and you out there in the chat? Thanks for joining us. Let us know what you think as well. Honestly, it's a it's as far as as far as filmmaking goes, this is this is a film that doesn't really have a traditional like three act structure. It kind of ebbs and flows in this kind of weird secular pattern. And but it's so enjoyable to watch. You know what I mean? Like you can sit down and just watch this. Well, my wife is not, you know, big on indie like our tour films out there you would consider the coen brothers necessarily our our tour but you, you probably would because they have a very distinct style and presentation but she said that she she was captivated the entire time we watched this movie um i think that it is it is terribly underknown but then again you just rattled off a bunch of movies from the coen brothers that i've never heard of either so um so that being said for a, for a movie that isn't well known but if you i looked up the rotten tomatoes it's like 90 something percent this film has got tons of critical acclaim and it's it's not just critically acclaimed for critical acclaim sake it's definitely a well-crafted well-made film you talk about the coen brothers being great screenwriters i think the difference is where quit where uh tarantino tends to write characters and dialogue that kind of hits you over the head and that's what's memorable the coen brothers build worlds they're like pixar for adults like they they craft entire worlds around their films so that said i i absolutely loved watching this i can't wait to watch it again and uh you know i i talked about it at work today i told construction type uh uh electricians today um that they should go watch this and, and they're just they're like just ncis, like NCIS guys <laughs> like they're not they're not they're not guys that normally watch this i'm like you need to you need to go watch this you need to understand you know 
the hell I live in each day and why I'm about 10 seconds from smacking you all the time. Like I, they, this, they need to watch this. So it's a great film. The way that I sell this film to people is I go, have you ever wanted to see Poe Dameron, Kylo Ren and Justin Timberlake do a song together? <laughs> about space. About, about space. space. I'm sold. <laughs> on that pitch exactly. alone. Speaking of sold, ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you the voice himself, Mike Matthews. What's up, Mike? <laughs> What's going on, everybody? How you doing? What up, Mike? You missed my beautiful rendition of Hang Me, Oh, Hang Me to start out the show, just so you know. <laughs> oh, I'm pretty sure I've, uh, I didn't miss anything. Yeah, and he's heard it plenty of times. Sure. It was pretty good. I'll watch it on the replay, if anything. Yeah, well, I, I like to sing a lot. Mike's heard me sing. Anyway, all right, glad you like it, Manny. Especially, on, was the second viewing different than the first? Well, I think... I think I, I don't remember watching. I don't remember watching it the first time. You know what I mean? I remember it being on this right. time. I was captivated. I was I was engaged. I I, I made time to watch it. And I think nice. that that made all the difference. That's why we do PCP movie night, y'all. As, as somebody asked me, they were like, Inside Lewis Davis, random. I was like, no, it's not random. It's one of my favorite fucking movies. And the only way to follow up Surf Ninjas is with this movie in my in my Hell estimation. Cleanser. <laughs> yeah, it's a palate cleanser because Surf Ninjas is so heavy. <laughs> you know? Speaking of uh, Surf Ninjas, my Surf Ninjas bro from last week, the only one who had my back last week for Surf Ninjas and its its, it's cinematic importance uh, was Brooks. Brooks, what did you think about Inside Lewin Davis? This was your first time watching. Yeah, I had never heard of this movie. Uh, this movie's too much of a downer for me, though, man. Like, it's so bleak to me, like, you know, but it, it is like, you know, it's a Conan Bros movie, so it does have like, it's, it has some very interesting, you know, uh, parts to it. But God, dude, like, it, this movie like had me so like, I was feeling a little down after watching this movie. <laughs> because it's just yeah. like that, it's like the, the whole struggle of the artist, you know, is something I kind of relate to and like how, like, you know, artists are like, there's this idea that, you know, an artist has to suffer for their art, you know, like, and it's like, it kind of—I guess—it kind of hits hits home some a little bit for me. Like, and it's like just watching this dude and like, just go through this like crazy ass. I don't know, man. It was it was, like it is still like it's a, it's a very nice looking movie, but I just think it's like it's a downer, dude. I, I'll tell you this, Brooks. Based on what you just said, I think the more you watch this movie, the more you're going to like it. Because I think yeah, right I now, I would definitely. I think right again, now maybe. you're. I think right now you're afraid to relate to it. It's it's like especially that starving artist type, right? There's certain types of us that this movie is definitely calling out, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, Brooks can get really really poetic, but this movie is it, it can be considered a downer, a depressing film. But I I find it still a little bit uplifting and inspirational, but. That's a cool perspective to hear, Brooks. I think I think you're gonna like this the more and more you watch it. And that's the thing with Coen Brothers movies; none of them are only worth watching once, right? Like 100%. Speaking of not worth only once, Steph, heartthrob that you are, why don't you tell us what you thought about this film? I uh, I loved it. I this was like many I had watched it years ago, like maybe just around 2015. But it was I. Put it on, meant to watch it, but yeah, as we do these days, we can get sidetracked by our cell phones, and I probably did. And I just remember like the cameos, like, oh shit, it's Justin Timberlake or Adam Driver, or, you know, stuff like that. So this was like a rewatch, a first time for me in a lot of ways, and I uh, thought it was great. Yeah, it's, it is a very, would you say, underrated Coen Brothers film. It should be talked about more. Nice. Glad that you uh. You liked it more on this rewatch. That, that, yes, that's yes. cool to hear. What about you, Mike? As soon as we uh, announced this one to the PCP excitable crew that we are, um, you jumped on. And I know you love this film. You, Mike, is actually the reason why I know about this film. Because I didn't know about this film. And then Mike was like, have you seen Inside Lewin Davis? And I was like, what are you fucking talking about? And then I watched it. It became one of my favorite films. So, Mike, what do you think about this film overall? I think at the time we were going to be doing a – Coen Brothers podcast when this movie came out and it was one of those like I think like Hail Caesar was like the newest movie that we had all watched and and it was just like there's no way we had time to do 
inside Lewin Davis, Davis. And I remember watching it and I was like, holy shit. Like, this is amazing. Like, this is like, you're going to have to watch this one. And then I always no, you're 100% right. Because I was like, you were like, you need to watch this one. I was like, well, I don't have time to watch yeah. that one right now. And, and like, you were like, you need to make time to watch it. And I think if you listen to that Coen Brothers podcast, I'm like fresh off of watching this movie. And I'm just like, sucking its dick basically i'm just like telling y'all like inside lewin davis is one of the best ones ever this is amazing this is what put oscar isaac on the map in my opinion what made him the star he is currently i don't know i, I i'd say that's ex machina that came out that came out after this though did it i couldn't remember if it came yeah, out before yeah. or after they uh well no it's just like i always like oh, when, I see uh, you. the uh, one of the things about this movie that uh, I'm sure we'll get to, but it's like when you like this movie was really influential to both me and Robbie um, after watching it because it was like this is what we're listening to at the store for like two or three days. It's like I'm sorry, you're gonna have to deal with it because this is the <laughs> this is the mood that we're in. And then it, then the, the the other flow of Coen Brothers soundtracks that that follow. So it's just the Coen Brothers. Cohen Brothers week of music, so nothing wrong with that. But yeah, this is it's a this is a great movie. Um, it's one of my favorites. Um, back when I used to have an SD card on my phone, it was it was like if I was when I was traveling, it's like I got to kill time and watch a movie. Um, it's one of like six movies that I had on my phone that I could watch at any time. So, so you really like respect. it? Yeah. All right. I really like it. That's what Mike said. That's what Steph said. Brooks is like, it's too depressing. Manny's also like, I really like it. And I'm like, I really, really like it. So a great movie can be made with the Coen brothers. But one of the great things that they do is they're casting. They cast the perfect people for these characters and they write these characters so well. And they are so brought to life by every actor in every Coen brothers movie, including this one. So I'm relinquishing because I got so many favorite characters in this one. And I got one I hope nobody steals. But it's okay if you do. Manny, what's a character that you want to highlight? What's a performance you want to spotlight in the Inside Lewin Davis? It's really hard not to steal Oscar Isaacs. Like, like it, he's in every scene. And he plays a bunch of music, and, and, and the, he does really good. Um, so you know what? Screw it. I'm gonna take him. Lewin Davis does an amazing job. I love that Oscar Isaac is performing these songs live. I'm. I love that everything that he's bringing into the scene, every bit of darkness, and and, and getting himself into those places, comes out in every note in every syllable. It's 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 affecting. He's he's a dick in this movie but he's so fucking likable as that dick i'd still want to hang out with him he could be like he could be like you know i'm not your fucking trained poodle fuck you and ruin my dinner party and i'd still invite him back at the end of the at the end of the <laughs> film right um just, just don't try to harmonize them with them no right? <laughs> what are you doing no. what are you do? uh, that's uh what's this part? i know what it is but what are you doing yeah <laughs> Oh, I was telling Tiff that's like the most relatable scene for me because every time I go, like if I go, if I go to a friend's house, somebody at the party or at the event is going to be like, oh, you know, I really need some pictures done. You should really do some pictures for me. And it's like, so I totally related to that scene because um, I was like, God damn it. I do this for a living. Right. But everybody I meet's like, uh, oh, yo, I, I got some comics to sell and uh, you should have me on your podcast because I know a lot about them. <laughs> Oh, and then you let me on and I don't go anywhere. So, right? you know. <laughs> and then I went to, I was at Chili's last week and the, the fucking waiter was like, you sound like you podcast or something. I was like, I do. He's like, you should have me on your show. I'm like, well, networking, some information, some criteria. Like, like is there a reason why? You, you need to tell me. He goes, no. <laughs> where, the, where the honey chipotle chicken crispers go? You figure that shit out and we can have a show. All right. <laughs> He made God, my drinks very well, though. I'll say that. Oh, well, there you go. There you go. Uh, yeah, I, Oscar Isaac's phenomenal. I, I already knew who Oscar Isaac's was when I rewatched it. So I have no, I, I, I you know, it wasn't like, oh, he was a revelation. Like, I knew he was good. Um, he's, he's dreamy as all hell. Like, 
Uh, and, Bruh, I mean, like, uh, it's it's no secret to anybody here. I have a major crush on Oscar. So like, beautiful major, hair in this movie. Like, dude, yes, and dude, oh my god. His hair, his hair is the perfect Oscar Isaac hair. Because you know when he cuts his hair short and stuff, he's still he's still cute. But that that proto fucking Poe Dameron hair, like we were talking about, is it's, it's, where it's perfect. Yeah, it is. And and like I I had seen like I think Force Awakens had come out. I think I didn't. I think I saw this film in like 2016 or something. I think this is when we did the Coen Brothers podcast, right? And I already knew him as Poe Dameron. I had I still haven't seen Ex Machina. Um, right. To be honest, as hot as Oscar is, I think he looks better with like that, like short grayish hair in Dune. Like, and Dune, it, Dune, yeah, God. yeah, yeah. I, I do love him in Dune, man. Steph, yeah. you better watch out because you're on your way to looking like. <laughs> <laughs> you better watch out. <laughs> I'm just gonna oh, say, now nah, he's amazing though because he's able to to have that humor, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Like think about the scene with with where they're doing uh, you know, please, Mister Kennedy, and and of course Adam Driver's doing that. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the ad libs are wild. The way that he just like, <laughs> like looks at him and just his response to things, you really feel the internal struggle of Lewin Davis in this film just through what Oscar Isaac is doing. It's brilliant to me. What about you, Brooks? What's the performance you want to highlight? Well, the thing about this movie is like it has a lot of bit characters basically, and. So, like, it, it, most of it centers around, you know, uh, Isaac's character, Lumen Davis, of course. But, you know, he, like, I, th I think my favorite character that he ran into was the driver, the guy who was driving him and John Goodman. John Garrett Hogan. Yeah, the guy who just gets, like, randomly pulled out and fucking arrested. Taken away for it, just, right, yeah, that was crazy. And I was like... I was like, what the fuck? Because, like, this cop is like, <laughs> they're like, I, I, it's because they're, 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 like, resting on the side of the road. And so he's like, he just pulls him up, he just comes up and he's just like drags him out and just puts him in the cop car and just leaves the other two guys You're there. Coming with me. I, was like, <laughs> oh, cop. Oh. I I love that that almost feels like like a little a little love letter to Cohen Brothers fans because he's like the one shady criminal type in the whole fucking movie. Oh <laughs> like they're like, we need at least one. Who's it gonna be? Yeah, he's Some just shadowy a, mysterious. He's the guy doing a job. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's, he's a I'm just he's a, a driver. Beatnik, right. And so like he's a beatnik at the tail end of the beatniks revel relevance in pop culture. Right? right. And both him and John Goodman's character represent warnings to Lewin about where he could go. Right. He can continue to be pretentious and successful because he wants Lewin wants to be successful. He doesn't take the right steps necessarily to get there throughout the movie, but he wants to be, he will either be the pretentious asshole like John Goodman's jazz artist, right? Or he'll be the forgotten guy just driving around the pretentious asshole, right? And so that that's an interesting like odyssey within the odyssey in the movie because it does feel like a movie within the movie, doesn't it? And it's yeah. that's the most dreamlike yeah. the movie gets. Yeah. New York stuff feels way more grounded, but the trip to Chicago and back feels very dreamlike in a way. So I think that's it's very. Uh, it reminded me of um the scene in No Country for Old Men when Josh or is it Josh Brolin? Yeah, he's uh he's all fucked up and he's uh he comes across those drunk kids or the party kids, and he's like, "Give me your jacket." He's like, "How much will you give me for it?" It you know it's some it's something very surreal about that scene, and that's what the driving scene in this reminded me of. Yeah, absolutely. What about you, well, Steph? What's what's a well, go ahead, Mike? Well, I was gonna say also. Do you, I don't know if you remember what I told you about. The whole gate of horn in the odyssey that was the the place where people go to get their dreams to get the there's the gates of the gate of horn mm. and the gate of ivory and then the gate of horn you get your you, you get to your dreams if you go to the gate of ivory that's where you fail and everything is false so it's just kind of like when you said like that's very you know kind of like two and two together right there with everything being very dreamlike and then like well you know you're going to the gate of horn so, so like it could be they could have done that for a, a very specific reason. Yeah, and one of those brothers. things where like the Gate of Horn was a real club yes. in, in Chicago. So it's one of those kind of like I'm sure the Cohen brothers were researching this film and they were like, Holy shit, we're doing the Odyssey again. Fuck it. You know, we're doing the Odyssey again. Call T Bone. Yeah. We're doing it again in a different way. That's name is Ulysses the whole time. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, what's your name? Out God damn it. I think the I think the Cohen brothers like the Odyssey. I'm just I just, yeah. just gonna say Oh brother we're out though. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no shit. Like it's there one hundred percent. Steph, what's a performance you want to highlight? Uh I like Michelle Williams character. Is that who the um what's her face? You mean Carrie his, Mulligan playing? Was that Carrie my yes, Carrie Mulligan, I think. Cause she was in Drive, wasn't she? Was yes. she the love interest in Drive? Drive yeah. I didn't really like her in Drive. Not to say she was terrible. I just something about her that it just didn't jive with me. But she, I really liked her in this. Like, you know, I felt it, not. I didn't really necessarily feel a struggle, but you know, she she hated Oscar Isaac, but she at the same time she loved him, and you know, she she was just very torn. You could feel her being torn, and that happens to people sometimes. Not endorsing what she's doing, but. Yeah. One thing my that, wife hated that woman. Like, well, I was going to say, like, one of the things that I noticed in this movie, because the person I was watching it with, like, pointed this out, was that why is she so fucking mean to Lewin, right? Like, right. I get the idea that Lewin has disappointed a lot of people. Yeah. And the idea of this movie is he's in a cycle. This yeah. is one life in the week of many weeks of Lewin Davis that went exactly the same way. Do you know I, what I'm I saying? Think it, I like how that I ties think... it. Sorry, go ahead, Steph. No, I was gonna say that kind of ties into like the opening and the ending of the film, how they kind of circular. Like it's just another week, just another week for Lou. It's the exact same scene again. Like like the yep. dialogue, everything was the same. I, I had double check with Tiff. I was like, didn't end that the same shit he said last time? Yeah, it it starts with the ending, and then it cuts yep. back. But the way that they do it, because he wakes back up in the same fucking place with that cat, right? And so it's yep. it's just showing us the cyclical nature of this of his life and what's going on. And she is really harsh. But if you, if you, if you, and if you can just like kind of think about the backstory, you can understand maybe why, but I love well, those little moments where Lewin stands up for himself, says, takes two to tango. I think yeah. you were a part of this as well. <laughs> yeah. It's not all on me. I could have double wrapped it, you know, and, and pulled out, but it doesn't mean that you weren't there ready to fucking go do the do, you know what I'm saying? Right. So, that Don't was I think there really was fun. yeah. I think that they were actually I think they were in a relationship before and Lewin just couldn't get off his uh, ass. And so Justin Timberlake's character came in there with the uh like, hey, like let's let's go. He was doing the things, yeah. Put our shit together. yeah. So, she could have been it, totally just, into Lewin like two years before, right? That's and yeah. Jim, his buddy, is way more like he's got it put to, he's he's put together. She was like mad at him, like, why can't you get together? I, I still like, I love, I had, I, she still loved him in a way. He's like, why can't you get together, like, grow up type of shit? Yeah, absolutely. Because somebody, somebody had said it, they, when they had watched it, they were talking, talking to me about it. And it's like, yeah, it's like his girlfriend married his best friend and he was angry, mm. and he was angry about it. And I was just like, good point. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that and started yeah. listening. What well, I, that what bit, I that bit in 500 again, miles. Yeah. I think her best bit in the movie is when she's singing 500 miles and looks directly at him. And then he, he like does this, like what? And then she what just immediately know. looks away, but you can tell that there is legitimate History affection, there. right? Yeah, and yep. yeah. 100%. So you're right about that. She, she does carry that. Well, you, us as the audience though, we have to fill in those gaps. And, and that's, that's what I like. I like a movie. If Joe was here, he'd be like, you tell me that this movie's written that doesn't treat the audience like a complete fucking dumbass. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's what Joe would say. And I, I'm going to repeat that real quick. Mike, what's a performance you want to highlight? Um, I don't know. Who are you going to talk about? Because I don't know if I want to steal yours or not. Go for it, man. You ain't going to steal mine. I, I promise you. Okay. Well, I mean, basically, uh, the, the character that I want to talk about is a character that we never see. And that is the character of Mike. And he is a very focal point for this whole entire movie. Um, he is the reason why. Of Lewin course, is Mike's going to take Mike. Yeah. <laughs> Mike on Mike. Um, but yeah, so like it's it's when she's like, you know, I miss Mike, and it was like Mike was essentially like a, a bright, happy center point that connected a lot of people, and and probably right. was uh, a, a focal point and a big brightness on that scene. And and it, I hate to say it, but it's one of those things too, where it's just kind of like he could have wrecked. Like Lewin didn't have it to make it on his own, but Mike could have saw that and it was like, "Well, I'll bring him along with me." 
So right. like stifling yeah. his career. It's like I'll put my career down a little bit to to help bring him along because yeah. it would be better as a group and it's not so and then it's just everybody everybody was touched different than Mike. Um the, what were the people's names that he stayed with on the upper the good upper West or side? G something. Gorsteins, yes. The Gorsteins. Like I don't maybe it was never implied. That's fucking like, Neelix from Voyager, by the way. Yes. <laughs> but I thought I could like I'm kind of putting two to two and two together that that could have possibly been Mike's parents or like somehow related to Mike. Those are Mike's parents. Um, they mentioned that. They in the movie. That's, yeah, those are Mike's parents. Because well, no, they don't mention it. I'm pretty sure they do. At some point, it, they're Mike's parents, 100. percent I think they mentioned so, in the movie, but they are. I always got the impression they were. Yeah, I think it's left to them the impression, but I don't think they are because, you know, he would have been, it would have been like, where did you stay at the Gorsteins? Like, like I stayed with, I, like, would, like, how would you, would you say, would you say like the last name or would you say I stayed at Mike's parents' house? I stayed with Mike's parents. Like, how would you? Okay, maybe, but I. Would I, that be different for, it may be different. Areas to use different lingo, like so. Maybe they would phrase it differently. A case of that. Fair, fair enough. Or like, different I, vernacular. I, I always, I thought that. I, I, I'm was pretty always... sure that they're. I'm pretty sure that they're. That's. I don't know. I've always got the impression that they were Mike's parents. I'll send so, a. I'll I, send a Twitter DM to the Coens. Find out what. They're doing. <laughs> please, do, please do. I just. Quick, I had quick this, question. I don't think I didn't I think they, they had, but but like I said, they were very. The whole thing was impactful, even in like. Even the way that John Goodman's character talks about, you know, it's just kind of like what happened to your partner, and it's like he jumped off the the Bay Bridge, and that's when. Have you? T- did you? I was late, so did you talk about the the whole Van Ronk situation? No, like we haven't mentioned similar, it yet. Similar. Okay, so this movie is essentially based off of like uh, loosely based off uh, Dave Van Ronk, um, a guy from the same time period from New York. He did an York. album called Inside Dave Van Ronk, and the cover is the same cover of Inside Lewin Davis. Dave Lewin Davis. And then, uh, and so we don't know why Mike killed himself, but there's a lot of speculation. A lot of, like, if it was based off of Van Ronk, one of Van Ronk's friends uh, came out and, like, had a hard time um, mm. with being gay in, in the 60s and, and killed himself in 1967. Um, so a lot of people were kind of putting like, well, that like Mike could have had had a secret that he was tired of living and took, and just couldn't take it anymore and just took the, and just killed himself for that reason. But we know that it greatly affected everybody. And then the only person that oh crap, I just forgot his name. Justin Timberlake's character. I don't think Justin Timberlake's yeah. character knew him. I don't think Jim knew him. Because like everybody, you can see everybody that was affected by him. Even like even Louis Allen's sister, you know, was 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 close to Jim, and Jim was essentially a family member. So, but I think I mean, Mike plays such a huge role into like the condition of why Louis is in what he's in, and and still dealing with the effects of it. Did they? I don't remember. Uh, did they say how long he had died? No, but he was very it feels very recent, right? Yeah, I, well, I, I got think in the like car maybe, ride he does say like last year. Or something. Okay, I, I thought for, I also I was did, thinking like two years. Or I looked up the cast list, and Marcus Mumford, of course, from Mumford and Sons, did the the singing voice of Mike, and he's listed wow. as Mike Timlin, which is not the Gorfine. So, right, I don't know. I just always but, got the idea that they were connected in some kind of way. But Al, but Al, uh, whatever his name is, Kylo Ren he talks name. about changing his name, so. Mm. So yeah, because yeah, yeah, folks. Are, yep. It was like Cody. I, said, right? I heard he could Cody's yeah. nuts across Al, your face. Al Cody. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, Mike, that's a really good one, Mike. Picking Mike, so, Mike. Yeah. That was really Mike on the mic. About very Mike. central to the movie. And there's yeah, more. And there's cent- more. And there's there's more about that that will come out later. So I second. only like the only I I wrote six people down. Right, because I always do that in case there's six people here. I write six people down, so I always have something to go to. <laughs> Only one got picked, and that was Manny picking Lewin Davis, but that's not the one. So runners up, Justin Timberlake is Jim. He's fucking yeah. awesome, and that yeah. beard gave me the inspiration to grow a beard myself. All right, no shit. Adam Driver as Al Cody. Sure. Ooh. 
Space. How about Stark Sands as Troy Nelson, the good natured uh, anti war soldier who's a folk singer, right? Just so good natured, right? Yeah, I, discipline. That's something. Discipline, I, I believe, is what you're referring to. I find that immensely satisfying. But killing, I'll never do. Weapons yeah. of violence are not my thing, right? So that's interesting. How about this? F. Murray Abraham, Conchu himself. I don't I see almost, a lot of money. I almost took that. I was like, God, it's God. I have to. Yeah, right. To it's God. it's it's God, right? He turned the universe backwards in the MCU, and nobody gave a <laughs> shit. Anyway, um, my number one though is the cat. The cat's my Ulysses. favorite character in this movie. My favorite shot when I was watching it, I told my friend. Um, Which cat? Because there's two. Doesn't yes. fucking matter. Okay. <laughs> the real Ulysses is my favorite then. And my runner up is With the, the scrotum. Other, the, the faux yeah. Ulysses. Where is his scrotum? Um, but my favorite shot is when Lewin's in the subway and the cat's looking out the window. The cat's trying to Watching. escape. And maybe we'll get to this, but I personally think that Lewin Davis is represented by the cat. Some people have this idea that the cat represents Mike. I think the cat represents Lewin because the way everybody treats that cat is how they treat Lewin. Jeannie is pissed about the cat. She is pissed about Lewin and his interference, mm. his stray cat interference in her life, right? The, 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 the Goit fiends adore and treasure Lew Lewin, even to the point no where what. he embarrasses them multiple times. Because when he wakes up, he says, sorry about last night. I, you know, he basically is like, I was drunk. Sorry about last night. That's the cycle. That's the cycle mm. that's happening. That's why that movie, I think that's why the end of the movie confuses some people. It's because it does, it's, it's cyclical like that. And it's, it's intentional. That cat looking out the window, reflection of the cat with the, with the, the stops of the subway breezing on by. This is a representation of Lewin Davis wanting to escape right and at times lewin abandons himself so every time somebody reacts to that cat pay attention to it it's the way they treat lewin and that includes lewin himself so ulysses is my favorite character style and structure i, well, I don't know real quick i don't know because they because they're re like every time you see the cat the cat is with llewellyn so you don't or lewin you oh, don't really I see you're We're right, always they, with they, ourselves, they, Mike. <laughs> and here's the thing. Here's the beautiful thing about film. It's not what it is, but what it is to us. Mm, like represents. to our experience. No, For me, the I, cat represents Lewin. I told Tiff the same thing because when he leaves that cat behind with John Goodman, he goes to join the Merchant Marines. It's him leaving behind his existing his existence as Lewin Davis and going and giving it up. And then he's surprised when that doesn't work out and the cat's returned home. And now he's just back at it doing the exact same yeah, thing. Yeah, I would say this because I think the at the end, I think Lewin does make a change at the end. And then that change is letting go of Mike. Yep. But he lets go of the cat before that, even though it's not the real Ulysses. And maybe that's a point too. I think the cat can represent both because the Coen brothers like to put this shit in. The Coen brothers like to put their thematics into their script. And the mm. first time that like when, uh, when Oscar Isaac is talking on the phone, and he's like, tell the Goyt fiends that I have their, Lewin has the cat. You mean Lewin, Lewin is the cat? Yeah. They literally say, Oh Lewin. yeah. Right. He's like, no, 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 no. I am and Lewin. And there's yeah. the moment where he talks to John Goodman's character and he goes, did you have a partner? He's like, yeah, but you know, it, you know, he, he died or whatever. And he's like, so what, then you, you took on the cat adding the idea that the cat is the new partner, right? So I think it represents both because I think that the cat represents Mike and his hold on Lewin. Mm. But the way people treat that cat is not how people treat Mike. It's how people treat Lewin. Al Cody is very accommodating of the cat, just like he is Lewin. Troy is very generous and soft with the cat, just like he is with Lewin, even though Lewin is being a dick to him, right? When they're having that conversation in Jim and Jeannie's living room the very next day. The way Jeannie responds to the cat, the way the Goy fiends respond to the cat, the way Lewin responds to the cat is the way he treats himself. That's just what I take from it. So that's just me. Well, I was going to say real quick, there was a, one of the articles that I read, they said that the, the Cohen brothers love to mess with critics and to throw false 
directions and of of like in the Hudsucker proxy, you had the circles and the oh the other John Goodman film where he's the devil. Um Allen? Barton the hotel. Fink. Barton Fink, Barton Fink. Barton Fink, the it's the mystery package. Uh and it's, what else was there? Circles, mystery package, uh Miller's Crossing, it's the hats. And inside Lewin Davis, it's the cat. Like they're throwing that like they're trying to say like, oh, like Lewin is the cat. Like here's your here's your false bait. Go take it and run. Because everybody's like, oh, look, he said like, so that was the article saying that this is the Cohen brothers just going to critics. That could so, be the case. That's why, the, that's cat's why... Name? the cat's name is what Ulysses? Ulysses. Ulysses is part of the Odyssey. He goes in this giant journey. It's Odysseus, right? Who goes on the right. journey right. in this movie? Lewin. It's Lewin. Yeah. Well, and, and when does he decide to go to Chicago, right? Like, you want to go to Chicago? Nobody wants to go to Chicago. He and he knows that Bud Grossman's in Chicago. But when does he do it? When the Gorfians say, where is his scrotum? Where are your balls? You know what I mean? Step yeah. up. Move forward. Lewin, Lewin has two L's in it. Ulysses. Also two, two L's. Does it? Have two uh, he, he, he says yeah. his... Yeah. Oh, wait, I, I don't know geography. I was educated in America, but... Uh, he says his mom's Italian. Isn't that by Greece? Right? The... It's closer to Greece than New York. Yeah. Ulysses yeah. So Ruin is and it's closer, New York's closer to Greece than Chicago. Maybe. There we go. Maybe. There we yeah. go. Yeah, I'm sure about that. I'm sure. All right. Style and structure. We're going to get into this later. Trust me. Style and structure. Uh, Bruno Del Bono. D Del Bonnell is the uh, cinematographer. He did Amelie. He did Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, which I think is one of the most beautifully shot Harry Potter films. He's not the typical person to work with the Coen brothers, but their typical dude, who I can't remember his name, was unavailable for this film. Roger but Deans. I love the way this movie looks because it's gorgeously shot. The lighting to me is superb. It's got this soft kind of feel that makes it feel classic, vintage, dreamlike, and grounded at the same time. I love it. There are moments where... Fluorescent lights in the bathroom ground us, but then other moments where they're on the road and everything gets hazy and dreamlike, almost like taxi driver a little bit in certain aspects. I think structure wise, it has an excellent pace. It is over before you're ready for it to be over. It's less than two hours, just over 90 minutes. And every time this movie ends, I want to spend at least 30 more minutes in this world. And that's an expertly paced film where you want to spend more time, but you still feel like you get a satisfying thing. As far as the script goes, it's funny, it's absurd, it's bleak, and it's surreal. But it has great dialogue and great characterization. Manny, what do you think about style and structure? And continue on for us, please. Boom. Uh, style and structure, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, Bruno Del Bonnell taking over for, for Roger Deakins, I think is... It's an interesting choice because they are very different in their approach to filmmaking. They both like medium shots. They both like 35 millimeter stuff. That's that's cool. But Deacons is very precise with his shooting where Devin L, he shoots a lot more coverage in this film. There's a lot more coverage. I know they're doing live music and that's it's a it's a practical choice. But Deacons doesn't do that. He generally will fix the camera in a location and let a scene unfold specifically for that. He shoots a lot, of, you know, a lot of prime lenses. Doesn't like to doesn't like to fuck with with uh, with the shot too much. Dibonel's totally different. Uh, vignetting that's something you could watch interview after interview with Roger Deacons. He'll tell you he doesn't like to vignette. He doesn't like to do weird stuff with his lens. And this one, he uses this really soft. Or really a uh, shallow depth of field. So everything has that hazy appearance that uh, Robbie was talking about. That's again, that's a very stylistic choice that I, I don't think would exist if they shot with their regular cinematographer. I think that it would have completely and fundamentally changed this film not to go with him. Um, both of them are real big on color grading. So I think that that still fits in with the art or nature of the Coen brothers. It, it, ties all of that still together it still fits really well in their filmography um writing it it feels like a collins brothers movie it's it's a lot of comedy and it doesn't have like the the violence the like sudden jarring violence but it does have these real like weird moments in the pacing where you the 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 road the trip tension. in the 
Yeah, the road trip. Well, the road yeah. trip in the middle is like a totally. Di- it pu- it's like I said, it's not like a traditional three act structure. This is like it's got these weird ebbs and flows, and this film like j- pulls you around like that. Um, so maybe it's Jason and the Argonauts, and this is our boat. I don't know, but hmm. it's it's very <laughs> it's uh it's it's very it's very well done. It's still very much a Coen Brothers movie, even if it doesn't really look like one. Um, but that's what I think. Speaking of, you know deep thoughts but not looking like it brooks what do you think about the style and structure of this film i mean it's it's got that cohen brother style which is always you know plus i think the shot that i like the most this movie is the hallway you know that hallway that like just narrows down and it gives that impression of this like tiny cramp angular thing. yeah the doors are right next to each other yeah it's yeah. like it just it just gives you that the impression that this is just such a tiny little space like you know that you're moving towards like this like compressed kind of space but uh, yeah, yeah i mean it's it's yeah. a very like uh it is a coen brothers movie through and through and uh it does look it looks good you know uh, it's got some really good shots like the sh- like the cat the shots with the cat like the one where you know it's following the cat as he's walking down the hallway like yeah, so uh, very. It's what I. It's, it's kind of like what I, I expect from a Coen Brothers movie, I guess. Yeah. Style yeah. Style. Nice. What about you, Steph? What do you think? So it was. Uh, Manny, uh, by the way, that was a really uh, great, great segue. That was a great segue into Brooks. Like I, I, I applaud you. Yeah. <laughs> You're gonna get great was... segues, Steph. What do you think? <laughs> It was beautifully shot. Um, you know, the Coen brothers, it's no, they're no stranger to having great composition in the film. And even though the cinematographers have different styles, I wouldn't have known that this wasn't their usual cinematographer. Um, I think he worked very well with them. He, you know, there's a lot of close-up shots in the movie. And sometimes those can be be boring if they don't know how to set up right. But the close-up shots felt very intimate which is fitting for the movie. So I like that a lot. Um, like you said, Manny, it, the whole movie, you're going on like these ebbs of flows, but uh, in terms of structure, but I think it works. You know, we're going on the journey with this guy and there's ups and downs in the journey. You know, it's never just one straight road. So I enjoyed it a lot. And segues, Mike. So one of the things that, <laughs> Like Manny pretty much nailed a lot of it. Um, one of the uh, things that the Coens like to do is what it, it what is it called? It's like it's like close up or wide like close ups with wide wide angle lenses, where you're getting it kind of gives a distortion to it. If you go back and and look at the way he, they do a lot of their conversations, it's always on one person and another person. Let's. It is a cut. They never have, they never have the over the so, over the shoulder. They uh, when, uh, take that it's back always it's your... always a reverse. It's always a re- uh, reversing. Or you can always take you can even take it back to like raising Arizona, even something commercial like that. Right. right? Yeah, they do a, they do a lot. They do a lot of it. There's and they have a sp- specific style uh, that they like to use, and you can see it in there. And it's work. And I think the having the different cinematographer works well because it's kind of like hey this is our standard shot is this close up with the wide angle lens and it's just like okay i got you and he nails it perfectly um because if you look at the coen brothers there's not a lot of over the shoulder not a lot of over the shoulder shots so when you actually see um f murray abraham's over the shoulder watching llewellyn play which is something that they don't really because that's still a conversation with that with that song, so right. yeah, like that's so that's I mean, I mean music is words. So, um, but yeah, that's that's basically one of the things that they did different about this film. But it's still very the same. That color, um, desaturating a lot of the color made this film was a lot like. It set a very good tone for it because if it didn't have if everything was normal and bright colors then if they it was just it would have that sucked. that muted, it would have been as dreary tone. that yeah. muted yeah. greenish yeah. tone is a del Bonnell staple and thank you manny for yeah. 
teaching me how to say his name correctly. But Amelie, Half Blood Prince, these are things that like they have that same kind of look, right? But it 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 fits the tone of those stories. Like Amelie's maybe a little bit brighter, but they're still like it, like I said, it feels vintage. It feels like almost like we're looking at a photo of the speaking of vintage, right? There was I, I think a lot there's of there's a, a shot of 35 mil, right? So you oh wow you, you know what I mean? So so that's that that focal range is is really good for photograph right a lot of us like to shoot on 35 millimeter for, for yeah. portraits so it works really well it's 185 it's 185 by one so the characters totally fill that frame you know what i mean they're big and they fill so it, it work. i don't know it just it works so well sorry Stephanie. there is an um, uh, no 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 that, that ties into what i was saying like there's a scene where um Right after the he does the interview that Mike was talking about, he's like walking away from the place, but it's he's like in the middle, in the center of the shot, and he's just walking yeah, towards the camera. It's kind of like zooming up on him. It was just a beautiful, iconic shot, and it, you know, reminded me of like a cover from a Bob Dylan. Yeah, they they, they said a lot of his a lot of his uh, a lot of his walking shots look very similar to the Free Will and Bob Dylan cover. Um, yes. But the funny thing yeah. about that sh that's, that scene, stuff that you're talking about, if you go back and watch it, he's walking down the middle of the road in the snow, mm -hmm. and both sides of the street are clear. It, so he's making, it, he, he's making it harder on himself because he's walking in the middle of the road in, in the, the snow, <laughs> in, but in the center, but if he goes to the left there's and no right, snow. there's no snow. Oh. So, that's symbolic for the, Yeah. Like he's just making it difficult on himself. Even and he doesn't have to. It's just like choose a side. Like if you just choose one side, your path will be clear. But no, you're gonna stay persistent right. down the middle. Before we dive down that road, let's talk about the music real quick. And I swear to God, if Brooks did not notice the music in this movie, I'm it's <laughs> never gonna be on a movie night again. The music is amazing. It's put together by T Bone Burnett, who put together the music for Oh Brother Where Art Thou. They wanted to do something a little bit different. What I love about the music here is that it shows the gap between commercial and authentic folk music, right? And on a large scale, that's saying something about American pop culture, I think. There is an authenticity to what Lewin is doing with folk music, where he's taking these, these, these old songs and making them still feel very real and earnest, right? On the other hand, what's getting popular, what people want to hear, is the Peter, Paul, and Mary shit. Right, they want to hear 500 miles. They want to see a happier version of these sorrowful folk tale, like folk songs from early like Americana music. Right, you know what I'm saying? As far as some of my favorites, "Hang Me, Oh Hang Me" is a great way to open the film. It was a great way to open tonight. "Fare Thee Well" to me is the most important song for me personally in the movie. And the performance that Oscar Isaac delivers at the end, he's given it his all. And you feel the emotion coming from that. And another thing I love is every bit of it was recorded live, except for the Triangle Bojangle song or whatever the fuck that one was. Um, everything's recorded live on set. They did studio recordings, but that was a practice session. Everything you see in the movie outside of the, the acapella shit at the end is actually recorded live on set. And it blows me away. And they did the same thing by using live recordings of music for Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Right? So it has this grounded authenticity to it that to me shows a complete reverence for the music, for the era, and for the artist that is trying to capture. What do you think about the music, Manny? Dude, uh, I was all on board for like Mumford and Sons and all that pirate like stuff that New Jersey in between New Jersey and Ireland, whatever the fuck world Mumford is from that. Uh, that was that was like that was that was my jam for for a minute there. Um, so I was all about it. I'm not a huge folk music person, though, in general, um, like uh I mean, I, I guess I guess I get down with some Puff the Magic Dragon about as much as a, the next guy. But other than that, it's pretty much uh, it was it it what it what works is that this type of music fits in with the film and what the film's trying to do. It it not only is it just you're you're hearing Oscar Isaacs give these performances that 
make you think, why hasn't this guy made it? He's effortless, right? But it's also used, I think, because of the way those songs are in, to make things a bit uncomfortable, right? Because like when he's singing to his father, his father's giving him nothing back. There's no feedback there. And the song, because it's just a repetition of a melody, feels like it's going on for way too long. Like it feels uncomfortable. And like so that as a as a moment to punctuate a scene works so well. Um, but otherwise, I mean, the, the music, the music is good. Oh, yeah. What about you, Brooks? Did you notice the music in this film? Uh, yeah, I did, actually, surprisingly. It's kind of uh, hard not to, right? Yeah. But, uh, it, I mean, it's, it, it, it does remind me of Oh Brother Where Art Thou. It's, you know, it's kind of that old-timey type music. Uh, we like but, that but, old-timey but, music. Even that soggy bottom boys. Y'all got soggy bottom boys playing Man of Constant Sorrow? <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's 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 a little more mo a, mo a little more modern, I guess, old timey. It's like you know, a, a more modern, like not obviously not like modern day like today modern, but uh, a, a more modern version of, like of how people would like, like you know you interact know, with music like, of like old time, time. Yeah, like like yeah, like, like old timey folk folk music stuff, and like it's it's kind of like you know the. It's good. It's, I like how they, you know, they show the different ranges of folk music too. You know, you have the more upbeat stuff. You have the, like the more kind of almost spiritual stuff, and then you have the more blues inspired stuff, which I think suits this movie probably more than anything. Is like you know that that very like uh, the way that kind of attitude that the blues have of like you know everything's bad, but you know what are you gonna do but sing the blues? You know. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's I, don't, I don't know if I would say this movie soundtrack was better than oh brother where art thou's but i'd say they're probably pretty pretty even i'd say word i'm, I'm glad you noticed it brooks what about you steph what do you think about the music speaking of uh noticing it uh, <laughs> 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 i thought it was beautiful i it showed that you know that you know even if you're not a fan of like folk music i think you can walk away from this film with a respect for it and then you know it shows that the the Coen brothers approached this movie with they wanted to be as authentic as possible and you know it shows they have a respect for the genre they were talking about so yeah I thought it was great and I, I'm right there with you Brooks I I would say they're about even but I would give the edge to brother where art thou and nothing yeah. beats a I am a man of constant sorrows so yeah. That. You want to continue on? Well, harmonize. Me. <laughs> <laughs> Go to sleep, you little baby. Oh, you just, oh, man. Now now we got to do a brother soon. Like, for, <laughs> I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. Um, it. It was 2017 since the last time you guys did a Coen Brothers podcast. You guys are due to, to, to redo it, I think. Yeah. Well, we're definitely due to have a Coen Fest, probably, right? 100%. Mm -hmm. Um. I was gonna sing something. I don't even remember what. Oh, I was gonna say like the true respect is, please, Mr. Kennedy. Oh, uh oh, <laughs> uh oh, uh oh. <laughs> yeah. I, when um when he first walked into that scene and they're rehearsing and he's like looking at Adam Driver because he's over there in the corner like oh oh he's like it was I at first I had the same reaction. I was like what the fuck is he doing? Like they're practicing <laughs> singing and he's just I, over there ad libbing. Even Justin Timberlake's like, and he's the one that. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I, I think Lewin actually likes that poppy shit more than he lets on. That's the happiest he is in the movie. Like oh, when you see him play and he's smiling. Wait, wait, you want the pop, 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 wait, 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 you want to go into the, wait, 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 pop, pop, pop. I love that bit so much because you can see him struggling with that the entire, pop, pop, please. <laughs> like, <laughs> now you're right though. He's into it, man. He just signed away the royalties so he could get that quick cash, right? It didn't even need it. Didn't even need it. Short sightedness, man. Speaking of short sightedness, Mike, what do you think about the music in this film? That was a good segue. Well, I was going to say the to me the most important film, like or song that we talked about, was the death of Queen Jane, the one that he read in front of uh, oh da 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 Bud Grossman. So mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's which, by the way, just to show how much he likes to shoot himself in the foot. This is his moment, his shot to make an impression. And he does the most depressing, fucking sad song to this well, dude it, who's trying to sell tickets in Chicago. 
<laughs> That's because thematically he's he's pleading his Reluctant. case before God. He's at his oh. lowest point, and everyone around him is being successful but him, or seems like they're getting some monochrome of success. And God says, I don't see value in you. Like that is a very poignant scene. So I think that 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 song is him pouring that that's the equivalent of pouring his his heart out. That's his magnificent to try to try to make, plead his case before God. I think word. Well, and it one, of, one of the things. So, so one of the things that I read before, like at this time before, because essentially, in the in the folk music lore legend, that night when Bob Dylan is seen at the gaslight is when folk music itself blows up uh, but, to yeah. a different level because then like bud grossman essentially signs dylan then his first album comes out then then 62 the second first album comes out 63 dylan's second album so mm -hmm. so it's kind of like so at the time a lot of people were, were writing their own stuff but they were also borrowing and they were borrowing stuff that what best represented them and how and what they were and right. so, like I talked to Robbie about this earlier, and it was just like, look, he's the, the we already found out that you know the lady the, the first girl kept the child, and so he's got a he's got he's got a he's got a two year old out there in the world, and he's got another child that's we don't know if it's gonna live or die yet because she she still really hasn't made that decision. Were we sure it's his? Remember, they said David, he goes to Dr. Lewis Davis's child and uh, Jeff Lebowski's child meet each other. Because <laughs> remember, the bar owner said he had sex with um. Her yeah, team. but we don't know. We don't know when that happened. Leave it to mm. Steph said, to be like Maury Povich up in this motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> his child. Well, he said she she doesn't know she doesn't know if it's Jim's or Lewis or Jim. She doesn't care. Right. She doesn't care. Right. She's like, I don't want. The, the fact that it could be it. yours right. is why right. I want to get rid of it. Yeah, and so it's just because so that the whole him singing the death of death of Queen Jane is a very it's very him. That's kind of what he's experiencing, what he's feeling, because it's like he it, he sings the sh the shit out of Dink's song, and um, so it's just like okay, like why doesn't he do that? Like all the songs that he sings, why? Why does he do that one? Because that's the one that best represents the way that he's feeling at that time and moment. And like, it's right. also because you let her see, you let her see that in when he's driving back and it's just like, he's driving past Akron and there's a part of his, there's a part of him that wants to pull off and being like, I'm never going to be this close again. Like, I'll, let me go. And then he doesn't. So there's, it, there's, I think that that scene with that song, it has, it's essentially there's a lost there's a lost child. He does eventually, Mike, leave a piece of himself behind because he abandons the cat. Well, I mean, it, it's the the cat and the child are two different things at this point. So, <laughs> I got you. No, well put, well put. All right, we've been trying to get deep all night. Let's get fucking deep. Sixty nine mega dot com is here, everybody. <laughs> Oh, so let's get, welcome let's back. We've been let's get real deep. Manny, what is Inside Lewin Davis saying to you? Uh, it's a really good music uh, movie about folk music. Like, uh, and that's that's pretty much no, it's 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 about that struggling artist. Uh, it's about it's about it's about trying your best to be your most authentic self to the detriment of of your most authentic self. He really sees himself as this deep artist, right? When, 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 um, when, I don't know, uh, Gomer Pyle's like, Hey, I'm going to have somebody come up. And he's like, his first impression is I don't even have my guitar. Like his first impression, his first inclination is he is the best. He is the deepest. He is everyone else's careerist and square, but not me, not Lewin Davis. I don't even rock a coat because tweed is cool. Um, literally because it's winter and, and he calls genie careerist right after he takes a bullshit gig 
doing please mr kennedy yep <laughs> and like so and, and like i said when he's performing that he's i think he's into it i think there is part of him that could easily do that and 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 would if he didn't see himself as something else i think um and uh and like i like i was alluding to with the bud grossman thing there's there's something about about trying about hitting that rock bottom and determining what you're gonna do with your life you know i'm 36 years old I would absolutely love to sit around and talk about comic books and movies on YouTube for a full time gig. But I also have a six year old and a two year old and I can't do that. Like, I know I can't do that. There's a part of me that does not want to let go of that shit. Right. Um, I was talking to uh, to my brothers earlier today and I was like, I feel like J.R.J.R. when it comes to my art, to my artistry, I go and I, I, I take photos in the most sterile commercially viable way possible to earn a paycheck. I do not inject any style. I do nothing to be further myself as an artist. I've, I've become Jim in this film, right? My videography, everything I shoot for clients is simple slider shots, three point lighting and clean. I, and that's me. I'm Jim. I, I, ref- I want to be Lewin, but I'm Jim. And I think that like, there's, there's something to be said about that. Like you sacrifice your authentic self either for, commercial success or careerism or you give in to your authentic self and potentially couch, couch surf. surf. So, so there is if you're, something if very you're, If you're Jim relatable. and I'm Llewellyn. You are. I, I, Llewellyn, I, God damn it, I'm not going to Llewellyn, without, Llewellyn, without, Llewellyn, without, Llewellyn, without, Llewellyn, without breaking kayfabe I there was a Llewellyn in, uh, I oh, legitimately sorry. said Mike is an artist and I am a photographer. Like all I, I just go out and shoot senior portraits and weddings and shit and family sessions. And they all look like the same generic shit you see on Pinterest. Like that's just what I shoot. I've become comfortable. And I legitimately said Mike zero six is an artist. That's so, fine, Manny. I just, I think it's a bit sad and careerist. Yeah, it, it is. It absolutely Where? is. <laughs> but yeah, it's just something relatable about being. It, it, it's a super relatable movie for artists, I think, and I, I think it's something we can all see ourselves in. Yeah, absolutely. Ways. Speaking of seeing ourselves in someone, Brooks, I see myself in your eyes, and it's beautiful. Brooks, why don't you tell me what you think this movie's speaking to you? And I don't want you to get too depressed because I know this movie's a little mm-hmm. too much. We've been doing some dark movies for you. I'm glad Surf Ninjas was the <laughs> the, the highlight there for you. Yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed that imperialist gentrification tale. About yeah, if, if, we did, if we didn't have surf ninjas in the, mid, in the middle of Taxi Driver and Lewin Davis, like Brooks would be <laughs> fucked. I'm just going to say, he'd be like, I fucking hate my life right now. <laughs> well, yeah, this, movie, this movie reminds me of the, the myth of Sisyphus. You know, the guy who pushes the boulder up, up the mm. hill, and it's, but it always rolls back down. It's like he knows, it's like he knows, like, you know, he's he's pushing the boulder up the hill and he knows that, you know, he's not going to get to the end. It's just going to come back down. It's just going to be like, you know, the same thing over and over again. It's like, you know, this struggle for, you know, success. But then, like, the, the success is also, like, the success is, like, the ru- his ruin at the same time. So, like, that's just, that's like, you know, when he's talking to her and he's like, oh, so you just want the you just want to be a square and sell out. It's, just, it's like, you know, but at the same time, like, that's what he's trying to do. You know, he wants, he doesn't want to, you know, have to be like, you know, living day to day, barely knowing where, where, where he's, he's going to be next, you know, yeah. not knowing if he's going to have to shack up with, with somebody like, you know, just sleep on the floor. Yeah. But at the same time, he doesn't want to be a square either you know he doesn't want to be successful so every time he's gonna he gets close to you know getting that boulder at the top he's just gonna it's just gonna let it roll back down and start over it's kind of like uh it's like a, a it's kind of like a self-imposed curse i guess that he's put on himself yeah but like hopefully by the end like you know it's, it's he'll you know it, it's not hopeless you know he can decide not to do it you know he can decide to you know one way or the other to do one thing or the other, but uh, like the whole movie is is just him going through that, you know, the whole pushing the boulder and then just watching it fall back down. It's very nicely put. Speaking of Sisyphus, fuck. Steph, what do you think? <laughs> that was, you. That was very Sisyphus nicely fuck. put. I like it. <laughs> um, and uh, to, in Mike's defense, there was a Llewellyn in a Coen Brothers movie. No Country for Old Men. Josh Brolin's wife. 
Or no, Josh Brolin himself was Llewellyn. Yeah, but, not um, his wife. That would be weird, but okay. <laughs> Dad, but are we doing favorite scenes? No country. Throw me off. <laughs> sure. Can, all right. Uh, well, I just want to highlight one thing that was really cool. Um, when he's like coming b- right after he gets turned down for the record gig, the army dude picks him up. They're driving, and he passes Akron, and you can, you can tell he wants to pull off to the side. Shortly after that, he hits the animal in the road. You know, we don't know what the animal is. Uh, kind of looks like the cat, but I looked into it. The director said they shot it ambiguous. They shot it certain ways to kind of give people that vibe that it could be the cat. But he gets out the car and he's looking at it, scampering off. But, and you know, to me, it kind of felt like he had been told earlier on in the movie by Carrie Mulligan that, you know, everything you touch turns to shit, you know? And it's like, he almost part, to me, it kind of felt like he was like thinking about going to see if he could help or anything, but he had just got turned down for the record gig, you know, by being told you're a better partner than you are a solo act, you know, he, just find, you know, he passes Akron, knows he has a child out there that he was not aware about. And he's just kind of feeling like, yeah, may, man, maybe maybe everything I do does turn to shit. And he just kind of gets back in the car and pushes on. That was a really good scene. You know, one little note about that. So Bud Grossman is based on Albert Grossman, who put oh, together well, Peter, Paul, and Mary right at this time. So the uh, the implication being that he wanted Lewin Davis to be one of Peter Paul and one Mary. of the yeah oh yeah. wow because he did bring that up because he's like I got this group I'm trying to put together and uh yeah wow what the movie's trying to say kind of ties into what Brooks was saying with the pushing of the rock um you know he was reluctant yeah. the, the to change the syphilis story right the syphilis, the syphilis story yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's TV story <laughs> but he was uh you know he was very reluctant to change he. He wanted things to continue how they were when Mike was around. And that wasn't the case. Like, you know, that changed things. He thought he could continue going on like with like it was like when Mike was around and that just wasn't the case. He he had self, you know, it was about self-destructive behaviors as well. Like he kind of knew what he would do that bother people. But he was kind like I said, he was reluctant to make those changes to remedy his behavior to, you know, be successful. He like he kind of knew what he needed to do, but he didn't. Like he didn't want to conform, as you were saying. He didn't want to be a square. So, you know, it's saying a lot about self-destructive behaviors and being reluctant to change those self-destructive behaviors. Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. What about you, Mike? What's this movie saying to you? And everybody has been on the fucking ball tonight. <laughs> well, it's also like a person, you have to understand where he's coming from. And it's it's everything is from trauma and so he's yeah. dealing with grief he's dealing with depression and it's also being it's one of those where like mike abandoned him and he's just like well i didn't need mike anyway i can make right. it on my own i'm my own person and it's just kind of like it's not working out and so it's just and i think that i think that a lot of people could we don't know like with mike did they blame a lot of like what happened like Mike's this great guy that everybody knows, but as soon as he started working with you, like, like he Mike is a great guy, by the way. Just want you to know, Mike. So Mike is a great. And it's just like, so that's like, is is he getting blamed for a lot of what was he the link to? Right. He was the cat. Was he a catalyst in that? Right. Um, And it's just kind of like nobody really knows. So it's just kind of like, or is it just kind of like retired? Like retired of you. It's like we're already we're already past it. Like we've already we've already grieved, and it's just like we've moved on. And it's just like you need to also. But right. it's also his his grieving comes into the form of his career, and it's just kind of like his sister. It's just like, hey, I'm glad your music career is taking off because I hope you're not here to ask for money. And Great. it's just like, uh... and so it's just like that yep. that constant that constant. Uh, battle with you know with oneself and just depression and and grief and you know just just being down on yourself the whole entire time and it's just sometimes like you can never feel feel like you're you can never work your way out of it and then like it's funny that i just think of something i just thought of something that i'll talk to you about robbie and then uh because you you it's a person that we know and uh, they don't watch the show, but I still don't want to throw the name out over. But it's one of those, like, I go back and look at this person's life, and it's the same th- and it's the same thing. And it's just like, he's just, it's just like, you got to get him out of that hole and that cycle. 
And then it's just like when you do, he's a great person. And then, it, but he, you've got to, but he's the one that's got to pull himself out. He can't. Like he can't, he can blame other people for his failures, but it's like he's the opposite, uh, the one that needs, he's the failure, not not everybody. It's everybody's, it's everybody's, it's everybody's, it's everybody's you can't save someone it's who doesn't want to be saved. Yeah. yeah. So, you guys have all hit the nose on the head. So all I can do is just pay, basically encapsulate everything that everybody said. To me, this movie is about the cyclical nature of depression. Right, stuck in a rut. How many times have we felt like that? Sometimes we feel like that for a long fucking time. Stuck in a rut professionally, in our love lives, in our li- just in our lives. We, we get stuck in these ruts. And when you wind up in a deep, dark depression, even when you think you may be coming out of it, it's the cyclical nature of it. Lewin cannot actively change his life. He's been repeating the same cycle. It's why the movie starts with its ending. It's why it's ambiguous about the, the, the gold finds or the gold scene, whatever the fuck their names are. And mm-hmm. he literally writes the note in the beginning of the movie. Sorry for last night. You know, I really, I really had a bad one, right? Well, he did the night before by the end of the movie. So he just did the same fucking thing over and over, right? Carrie Mulligan's character, Jeannie, tells him the same thing. It's about getting in your own way. He so many times in this movie is offered the chance to, to affect change, to make a change in his life. He won't do it. Why? Cause he's stubborn. So it's about stubbornness, right? You're talking about the, the pull, pushing the rock up. Stubbornness is a big part of that, of the syphilis. Oh, yeah. story. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's a big part of it, but it's a, it's a self-made misery. Right. And that's what, that, what that's what link was saying. It's not just self-made misery. It's the comfort in misery because it's familiar. And sometimes misery and struggle and depression becomes more of a comfort than trying to escape it. So to me, it's about overall. And there's that gap between commercial and authentic folk music and how that, that says a lot about American pop culture, right? Yeah. Do we want the cheesy, overproduced bullshit? Or do we want something real? real? And there's always somebody doing something real. People all the time tell me hip-hop's dead. No, it's not dead. You just got to look for it. You got to look for it. Because it ain't what you're hearing on the radio. You know what I'm saying? And like that's the same with not just hip-hop, but all genres of film, of music. is yeah. Real shit is there. You just got to find it. But that real shit sometimes isn't successful because it commiserates within its own misery, right? So it's about, I think to me, it represents being in love with the struggle and a refusal to change because the struggle becomes comforting. Me personally, I don't really openly talk about this with a lot of people, but I do struggle with depression. And there have been plenty of times in my life where I have pushed people away including lovers, including family, including my personal closest friends. Because being alone and isolated in my misery and struggling to make something work gives me an enemy. So I can blame all of my bullshit on the fact that they just don't get my art. They just don't get me. They don't understand my personality. That's bullshit. It's bullshit. There's nobody should isolate themselves and be comfortable in their own misery. You got to make a change. And Lewin has struggled to make that change. I hope by the end of this film, he's made the change. Thing is, we don't know. That's poignant to me because we don't fucking know. I incredibly relate to the character of Lewin Davis. I see myself in this character. I see in myself this pattern of self-destructive isolation. And recently, I've made a very bold change in my life to break this cycle. And I feel like it's helped me. And so just through synchronicity, without even thinking about it, I thought about doing this movie back in October because I was putting the schedule together, right? And holy shit, 
has this not been a very monumental milestone year for me personally so far? And I have taken a chance. I have tried to make changes and I'm trying to break the cycle and I don't want to be isolated. I don't want to be blaming like the people just don't get me or my art or this or that. And I'm not trying to say I want to be a sellout. I don't want to be a fucking square. But Lewin is isolating himself from people that care about him. I'm not doing that anymore. That that's that's my goddamn 2023. That that's 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 what's going on this year. And seeing this movie with the person that I watched it with was very different this time. And it made me realize a lot of things. And I just want everybody to know I love you. And if you struggle with depression or bad thoughts like that, you're not alone. Don't isolate yourselves. Reach out. Take those opportunities. Right? And when somebody who's struggling opens those doors, walk through them. And one thing I love about everybody on this panel is that you've always been there for me. And I love everybody here. And Mike and Brooks, I know you personally, Manny and Steph, y'all have been here for me too. Because what y'all, y'all's love for PCP and being a part of this community has really uplifted me. And I'm very, very happy now for the first time, I think, in, in a long time. And we're all in this together, y'all. Not to get cheesy, but we're, we're the Wildcats. We're like high school well music. Said. We're all in yeah. this. You know, well we're said. all in this together, y'all. So this movie means a lot to me because I used to watch this movie and be like, I understand Lewin 100%. And now I watch this movie and I go, I understand him, but I hope he made that change because you don't need to isolate yourselves. You don't be, you don't need to find comfort in your own misery and struggle. Life is a struggle and that's a good mentality to have, but don't let that overshadow the importance of, connection and love in your life so that's what i'll say i love this goddamn movie and i love well you anyway time to rate this film out of five possible you digs you out there in the chat what do you think about inside lewin davis and uh manny why don't you kick us off boom it's it's uh oh hey i did make it already it is for me a it's a five i i can't find any i like Mike said it's endlessly rewatchable and not in a nostalgic way. You can just watch this film and continue to enjoy it. You don't even have to see something new every time you see it. It's just well-crafted, well-paced, great movie. Five digs for me. Damn, a perfect score, man. We haven't seen such a, a like since Surf Ninjas. <laughs> nobody gave Surf Ninjas five. In case you didn't watch Surf Ninjas, nobody gave The best we gave it was three. That was me and Brooks. Okay. Uh, so well said five five you digs a perfect score for manny what about you brooks it's a little bit depressing you said so what do you think yeah i mean i i, I might feel differently on a rewatch but i'd probably i'd probably give it a four so like init initially i would i would probably said i would give it a 3.5 but like the more i think about it it is like i did there's a lot that i do like about this movie and like i think i think i i should give it another chance eventually but it was very like bleak to me and like I don't know. It's it's like the Coen brothers are known for, you know, having these like uh these characters, you know, even if they are only like just pop in and I, I think this movie lacked that a lot because like most of the characters were so had such brief stints in this movie because of its focus on the main character. But it's still it's still a movie I think it's a movie I, I would recommend it to to some people, you know. But it is. I don't, th I don't think it would be like the first Coen Brothers movie I'd recommend to somebody. I like what you said. Where you're right. Aside, like unlike other Coen Brothers movies, everybody else outside of Lewin comes and goes in this movie. Very small parts, and it's like when Bud Grossman says, "I want to see something from inside Lewin Davis," right? Which I that's that's. And it shows that the focal point of this movie is on him. And Brooks, I guarantee you, it's going to be a 4.5 at least next time you watch it. All right. Steph, what about you? Out of five you digs, what do you give inside Lewin Davis? So sometimes when I watch movies, I'll kind of already kind of gauge it. This like 
30 minutes in and I'm like, ah, I feel like this movie's gonna be like a three. So, you know, just in general, not saying this particular movie. Um, so when I finished it, you know, I was thinking like a 4.5, you know, I just, I'm trying to be more critical as we all are, you know, that's You're real, this we're real critics now. <laughs> But I, like Manny said, I can't find anything wrong with this film. Um, you know, even it, it is a, a bleak film, as Brooke said, but I think that is part of the, that's the point. It's the human condition a lot of the times, you know, it's about that struggle. And, you know, we, people are their own worst enemy a lot of times, and uh, as Lewin was. So I'm going to give this one a five. I, you know, it's a, I'm glad that I watched this and I will be watching it again numerous times. Fuck and that. for the big characters in defense of that, you know, um, the, the bar owner, wh whatever his name was, like he was Poppy. a bit Poppy, but he had a character, you know, he kind of, you know, just like the drunk guys in uh, No Country for Old Men, like they were very brief, but half I think the guys Coen Brothers are good at fuck Genie. <laughs> right. Some fuck of them <laughs> <laughs> he's, like, he's like, you know what that means? He's like, yeah. They want to fucking jail. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, two of my crushes are in this movie. Oscar Isaac and Justin Timberlake. Jesus Christ. Can there be more hot people in this movie, please? Can Idris right? show up? What the fuck? Oh, Where, where's Margot Robbie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she Dries Elba. Goodness gracious. Man fuck alive. yeah, man. Five you digs. Yeah. Dude, nice stuff. Very underrated Coen Brothers film. Fuck yeah, man. Very underrated. Mike, Inside Lewin Davis, what do you give it? I give it a five. You digs. It's a uh, it's a fun movie. It's full of uh, suspense and action, and uh, <laughs> it's just. Uh, you realize we're not just talking about Mission Impossible Part Five right now, right? <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, I mean that. Hey, man. That. Uh, sorry, I was trying to find something. Um, but who sucked up? Who said it was? Uh, when it was it Steph that you just said, or was it Brooks that said, like, when Grossman's like, I want to hear something from inside Lewin Davis? I said that. I think that was Robbie, yeah. Okay, Robbie, that's what I was talking about. That's why he played Queen J. Are you okay? Do you know where you are? <laughs> yeah, no, no, I was sorry, what do you man. Smell I was... right now. <laughs> Take a sniff test. What do you smell? Uh, nothing. Lemon, <laughs> lemon grass from the candle. Yeah. Uh, no, but I'm saying is that's what he's like. Play something from inside Lewin Davis, and that's why I think that he chose Death of Queen Jane because that's mm. like that's something that that's a weight that he's carrying inside of him, and that's what that's the it's his emotions that you're trying to to figure out. We know he's sad. We know he's depressed. He's opening he's doors, grieving. and he, he's opening doors, but people aren't walking through them. But other people are opening doors, and he's not walking through them. So they both right. open it just, to each other, and neither of them walk through that door. Does that make sense? Not, you get what I'm saying? He's just not being able to create. Can... Oh, you muted me. You muted so. Just did that by accident. That's what I was just trying to say. <laughs> hey, I got to do it at least once a show, right? But no, that's what I was trying to say. That's why, that's why I think uh, the song Queen Jane was more important than, than the most important song because it was like Grossman says, give me something from inside Lewin Davis, and then he gives us his soul. Yeah. And it's a and he feels honest or truly just sadness and grief that there's a child in the world that he's no he has no a part of, and he's also about to lose a child, and so yeah. it's and it's regret and it's a lot of regret, and yeah. so he's just pouring his soul out, and and God just says there's no money in this, mm -hmm. so it's just yeah. it's very it's a very heartbreaking scene, so yeah, it really is. It's good point. There's a lot more to it than everything else. Oh yeah. This movie means a lot to me. I think it's beautiful. I think it's a masterpiece. And when I say something's a masterpiece, it means it's a five you digs. It's five you digs for me. It's a perfect goddamn film. It's my third favorite Coen Brothers film. And that means I have a high opinion of the Coen Brothers because No Country for Old Men and No Brother are the only things I think they've done better than this. But man, it's hard to say that because Fargo, Big Lebowski, Miller's Crossing, Martin Fink, Blood yes. Simple, goddamn even fucking lady killers i think is amazing the man who wasn't there with bill murray black and white like that's some good shit that the coen brothers do burn after reading i love haven't seen buster scruggs still same cinematographer makes me mm. want to watch 
Should I watch the anybody who's watched it? Should we watch the series or the movie version? Because they did like two versions of that, right? Didn't they? Yeah, it's it's a it's an anthology film, so it's uh I I watch it is I think it was presented as a movie first. I'd watch the movie version. Okay, but it depends on how you want to segment. It's I'll kind of the, the uh, right, so there it it's kind of the best of the both worlds because they the, the Coen brothers usually do that serious comedy, serious comedy, serious comedy. And Buster Shrugs, you get serious. Con- you get all of that into the into the one movie. So, I think it's it's a good like, very dark and disturbing to very funny. And, and what I love about them is they they do so many of their movies, is about the balance between the two, right? Yeah. Yep. Where even in Miller's Crossing, there are moments that are so fucking funny. In a very dark film. Same with Barton King. <laughs> same with Blood Simple. Same with every movie they did. Raising Arizona, a comedy. Yeah. Dark. Dark. Yes. If you really think about it, right? Like, we need to make sure we, we do every goddamn Coen Brothers movie on PCP Movie Night because they deserve I agree. it. Right? What yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, five from me, five from Manny, five from Steph, five from Mike, a four from Brooks, but Brooks, I guarantee you're going to work your way up to a five on this one. But for now, that's a PCP average of four point. Six, four point sixty nine, dude. Fuck yeah. it. That's it. No reason to subvert <laughs> expectations here. Um, what a great fucking show, everybody! Oh, this uh, is great. I knew that we would have a good time talking about this fucking movie. Uh, Third Rail says this movie is uh, this movie and Into the Wild are brothers in arms. Five days with uh, Emil Kirsch. What the Emil, Emil Hirsch? Hirsch. Yeah, Emil Hirsch. Yeah. yeah. I haven't seen that. Nowhere Bound says it's not for everybody, but it's definitely for me. 4.5 out of 5. Elena say. says it's like a 4 or maybe a 4.5 for me. It can't be perfect without resolution. And it was so sad. So she feels a little bit like you do, Brooks. She's a little sad, <laughs> a little dark. I feel like there's just a si- subtle, real subtle resolution. Because after he gets his ass kicked, he fights his way back to the curve and says, or oh, like he gets the last word, the last brushes last. it off. Yeah. But he's like, like, he's like, fuck it. I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to continue. I do think that there, there's a, an authentic change that happens to Lewin, but he still has to deal with the consequences of getting his ass kicked by the husband of the woman that he fucking heckled the night before. Well, and it's in, <laughs> there's a, there's a shift in color palette. The whole film is like Brown and blue. When he does that song at the end, it's green, green, traditionally in color theory represents life yeah and that's that when he performs that last song and what is the song Mm. fare thee well fare thee Mm. well ding song right which is and it's the most authentic interpretation because when you hear him and mike doing it it's like but when he does it there's so much like grit and texture to it and i'm not talking about a comic book i'm not talking about jim mothu i'm talking about (laughs) Oscar Isaac's vocal performance on that song. And he's saying fare thee well. And at the end of it, he goes, that's all I got. And he walks off stage. Yeah. And then what happens? Bob Dylan gets on stage and he's going to get noticed, but Lewin won't get noticed. He's getting his ass beat <laughs> as a consequence of all of his actions. Yeah. So yeah, pull yourself up, seek opportunity, make a change, especially when change presents itself. He's offered so many opportunities for change in this movie, and he he stops every single one. But I think he makes that change. Mm-hmm. I really do. Yeah. I think he makes the change at the end. I think it works out well for Lewin. We'll see when <laughs> Inside Lewin Davis Part 2 comes out, directed by Brooks Gibbs and uh, written by uh, Missing Link. <laughs> <laughs> With music supervision by Mike Zero Six, photography by... Uh, by Manny. Mike's there at six. <laughs> Shit, man. Probably by Mike. I mean, by my by Manny. And uh, for me, I'll I'll just be executive producer. I just want my name on it. I don't want to do anything. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Not a bad credit. Did you watch that behind the scenes with Marcus Mumford where he's like, I just want to be your assistant for a week. And then he ends up being on the soundtrack and an executive producer. Yeah. Oh, that's dope. <laughs> he was just so excited to even have the chance. He, so he asked T-Bone, can I just be your assistant for a week? And then by the end of it, because he had been singing so much and helping out, he ended up getting a producer credit. Yeah, no shit. All right. Uh, Two Gun says, you sold me, added to the backlog. That that means we've done our job. Yes. <laughs> we at least sold one person on this. Helena says, damn, I didn't notice that about the lighting. Brilliant. And the last word, too. 
And Joram says, thank you, PCP panel. Meaningful analysis and comments from all tonight. If you missed the show, catch the rewind. That's right. And the shit doesn't stop. Because next week here on PCP Movie Night, we're going to be talking about... Did I hit the button? Flash, Flash Gordon. Uh, <laughs> I haven't seen this movie since I was a fucking kid, y'all. So I hope it doesn't disappoint me. But we're doing this for Brian. So this is Brian's... Nice. This is for Brian next week. And then on Saturday night, join us for Blood Sucking Freaks on Dylan's Horror Show. It's a movie that Dylan des uh, described to me live on stream, and I immediately bought it. So I'm, I'm appreciative of him for, for allowing us to do it. Um, I haven't watched it yet. What's that? Said, isn't that buddy horror? Blood body Sucking horror. Freaks? Yeah. I think it's blocking bullshit horror. horror is what I think it is, but I'm not sure. <laughs> but I'm, I'm ready for some sleaze. That's not burial ground. All right. Speaking of burial ground, Manny's favorite fucking Italian film is not burial ground. So why don't you tell us what's coming up for you, bro? Where to find? You? Oh, if you guys, if you guys watch me for the last hour and a half, that is all you need of me. You got your fill. So go check out my homies over at Geeks Unleashed podcast. You guys, but the piece of army bad batch. They had awesome awesome discussions recently on the spawn movie which i love objectively probably not a good film but it's a great film in my heart and they also yeah. talked about jonah hex because that was a thing that happened so go and check out the uh the geeks unleashed podcast anywhere on was better podcast. than jonah hex yeah definitely i think we can all agree on that all right everybody cover your ears brooks what's coming up for you and jelani over at Well, uh, this week, what I've been told, we're doing, uh, I'm going to do a review of the Tyrus Flare figure from the game Golden Axe, which is what I'm looking nice. for. Nice. And, all, and uh, a, a, a wrestling figure, uh, Cody Rhodes, which I'm not as familiar with, but, uh, you know, Delaney, he's the wrestling guy, so he'll, he'll know more about that than I will. And I'll just throw my two cents where it's needed, I suppose. But uh, thanks to Jelani for making me be the show this week. I love doing that. <laughs> I feel like it's just square now. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit sad. Careerist. And <laughs> <laughs> a little Man, sad. I used to be cool. And careerist. <laughs> By the way, I just did please Mr. fucking Kennedy with Alf bump fucking Cody over there. So, <laughs> Uh-oh. That's a great moment too, where he gets this crate of all of his albums that didn't sell and when he's at al cody's place he finds the same crate of al's album it's just so sad well i love that whole sequence how they're in a hallway that doesn't fit he's on a couch that doesn't fit he can't fit his box under there because it doesn't fit the life of al cody does not fit you and davis like i love that i love that idea dude i never felt more like lewin davis or al cody in my <laughs> living room i have a box of Blood Skulls and Chrome, number one <laughs> fucking exclusives. <laughs> <laughs> I just give them away. <laughs> After getting hey, another we, one, I'm sorry. We got a, we got a, <laughs> we, got a no we got some shows coming up, so you know we can sign sign them and give them out then. We do. I'm just and gonna uh, take some to fucking MegaCon and give them to everybody I meet. <laughs> like here you go, man. <laughs> here, take one. Please fucking take this. You give me five dollars <laughs> if you want, but just take it anyway. <laughs> Thank you for that, Brooks. I believe that March 1st, we're doing a live stream on Go Figure that I'll be a part of. I believe. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's confirmed, but I, I believe it's confirmed. So, mm -hmm. Steph, why don't you tell us about what's coming up for you and where to find you and what you're doing? You'll find me amongst these gentlemen here, Bad Batch, any, any one of those. I'll be on Dylan's Horror Show this, this Saturday, covering the Blood Sucking Freaks. Uh, yeah, I look forward to that one hopefully it's that not burial ground awesome the movie looks awesome man i do love the cover and uh wednesday i will be cover doing a show with marks from geeks unleashed we've been uh covering the last of us episodes reviewing those and it's been a really good time so be seeing me wednesday hell yeah mike thank you for being here any final thoughts thank you um yeah the uh check this dude out uh that's what the, the movie was based off of. Uh, I actually found this. I've always been looking for his stuff, and I've, I can rarely find it. You got it a Dave Van Ronk album? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. That's dope. Yeah. God damn, weird stretch. Very proper. <laughs> so. 
Well, it's like I'm always looking for his stuff. Since since this movie has come out, I've always been looking for his albums. And the it's funny that I found this. Uh, I found that album at the book house in Dinky Town. Uh, Manny probably knows where that is. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's one of those like they had two records there. So there's an, last I checked, there was last time I was there, there was two. So uh, hi. So it's uh, check his music out. It's really good. Check out Bob Dylan. Um, speaking of Dink, if you check out Bob to, Dylan. Uh, Holy shit, Mike Mitch is Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> Bob I think everybody uh, needs to take out Beethoven. <laughs> man, there's, man, you'd be surprised. There's some people that check don't know. Check out Dave Van Rock and uh, this little known folk, folk singer, Bob Dylan. <laughs> I don't know if you ever heard of him. So. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> hey, man, you'd be surprised. There's some people that have no idea who Bob Dylan is, believe it or not. It's true. So, they, uh, but yeah, so, you know. So I got. Uh, I'm here. I'll be here. What I got? I don't know when. I'll be here next week or in two weeks. So I got some more shows coming up. Uh, I don't know. Yes, if you, you do, my friend. In two weeks, I think you're going to be here, right? Or is it next week? I, I don't. No, nope, I'll be here for Flash. Week? I am here for Flash Gordon, Cyborg, and Dress to Kill. I got my list right there. Oh yeah, there you go. All right, yeah, Cyborg's right after. Uh, uh, what what the fuck are we doing next week? Flash Gordon. Flash Gordon. Flash Gordon. Flash. Flash. I haven't seen that movie since I was like a kid. All right. So once again. You didn't see it during Ted 2? Did you not watch Ted 2? Never seen Ted <laughs> 1, man. Why would I watch Ted 2? Anyway, next week, join us for Flash Gordon. Is it worth uh, Fla- Flash Gordon? You know, I, mean, I don't know, man. I'm excited to see it. Blood sucking freaks. Uh, I don't know what I don't know what Scarpad's doing next week. I think it's uh what is he doing, Steph? Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm having to bring for it. Uh, sorry, it's guys. Something, it's Twilight Zone. Good. I don't remember what it was. Well, the Twilight Zone, yeah. Check it's out Solaris, that. George Clooney. Solaris, that's right. The George. Yes. I like. I really like that film. I haven't seen it. I'm looking forward to that. Thing. I like it. It's it's a it's a it's an American remake of a foreign film. The foreign film's actually better. So watch both. That's if what you I'm seeing. Yeah, but I okay. like both of them. I think they're. I I think Solaris. It's Steve Soderbergh. I love Steve Soderbergh. Uh, my favorite. Uh, no, nah, I was gonna make a joke. It didn't work. I was trying to make a soda joke for some fucking reason. I don't know why. Soderbergh, you know what I'm saying? Like my favorite soda is Soderbergh, but it's not Soderberg. true. My favorite soda is like. I, I feel you because I kept trying to tie in penis illin for penicillin with the syphilis <laughs> jokes we were making. I couldn't get that shit worked out either. <laughs> All right, well we're dipping out, and my final thoughts really are. If I had wings like Noah's dove. I'd fly the river to the one I love. Fare thee well, my honey. Fare thee well. That's a song from this movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> really? 